Well, good morning and welcome. We are somewhat limited today in the size because of the governor's new restrictions, but we are here live and in person. There's room for a few more and you're also, we're also live in your living room through Facebook or we'll be coming to you on channel 23 from Comcast Cable later in the week so you can watch the broadcast then. It's great to have you with us today. We are starting Thanksgiving week and so we're going to be very busy today with a lot but we're going to start by singing about our Lord and Savior, the living hope that we have. Let's stand and let's sing <clears throat> about Jesus Christ, our living hope. Oh 
washcloths, the soap, the toys, is so many of them never know what a gift is until they get these boxes. But God, just as, as they're so excited for that, God, I am so excited that they get an opportunity to hear about you in their native language. And God, I pray right now for the hearts of those children that are going to be getting these boxes. I pray that their hearts would be receptive to you as they go through the, the lessons that they will be taught out of the book that goes in this box. And God, I pray that these hearts would be changed for you and that these children would lead their parents, their older siblings, and their village to you, God. For that is why we do this, to reach hearts for you and to change lives for you. Thank you, Jesus. out to children and families uh, through this ministry. Pray that uh, people would be reached and they would learn about you and be drawn to you. Pray that uh, you, you, the boxes would be received and uh, you would safely get to the destination that they're met for and that the children would receive the messages within them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, first of all, for allowing those of us that are here to, to meet and praise you. Lord, we also then um, ask you for the blessings on these boxes and the children and families that will be affected by this. Lord, we know how important it is <clears throat> that people know about your love for us. Father, thank you so much for the sacrifices that were made to make these boxes possible. Lord, it is a reflection and a thank you for the sacrifice you made by sending Jesus to die for us. And Father, as we send these boxes forth, we put them in your hands to make sure, Lord, and trust you that they will get exactly where they need to go. And to each child that they have been ordained for. Father, I believe fully that each and every child who receives one of these boxes, their siblings, their parents, their grandparents, their extended family, their neighbors, each and every one of them can be touched by the love of the gospel of Jesus. Lord, we send it forth in the power of your Holy Spirit. We send these boxes out with your leadership and your anointing upon them. 
Father, they're not just toothbrushes and toys. They're not just combs and band-aids. They are all part of the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the creator God of the universe loves them, loves us, each one individually. And gave his son to die to pay a price that we couldn't pay. Lord, let that message ring out clearly and loudly from every box that Operation Christmas Child collects and sends around the world. Lord, let them start a revival, a spiritual awakening in these dark places, Lord, where they are so poverty-stricken and they have little hope. Lord, we pray that the living hope that we sang about earlier will shine from each and every box and that lives will be touched, hearts will be changed. Lord, that through these boxes we will be able to impact eternity. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much.
has saved us. God has blessed us. And Lord, you're welcome here. As we head into Thanksgiving, we need to count our blessings. When upon my fiddles you are tempest falls, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God
inspire me, to challenge me, to point out to me the ministry and mission opportunities you give me. Lord, now as we look into your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us something that we've never seen before, and that you will help us to understand the calling we have on our lives, and that that calling comes from you and you alone. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Take out your Bibles. We are finishing up a series that I started a couple of weeks back. And I apologize again that I had to miss last week, but life happens. And there are more important things sometimes. As followers of Jesus, we have responsibilities as they pertain to living in this world around us. A couple of weeks back, we looked at Ephesians 4.1. That was one of our key verses. We'll look at it again today. Ephesians 4.1 says, Therefore I, this is Paul writing, of the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. And this calling you've received is from God as a follower of Jesus. And this calling involves more than just living a good moral life. That is a portion of it, but that is a small portion. It means more than just trying to grow and mature as a Christian. We looked at some of the callings in our lives. Last time we looked at the callings that we have as Christians. We looked at the callings that we have as family members. And we looked at the callings that we have as employees, which some of you are retired. Those of you that are retired like John, his employee or his employer is now his wife. You know, I've seen I've seen the t-shirts. You know. I'm retired. I can do what I want, when I want, because I want. As soon as I ask my wife. You know, I'm sure someday I will have one of those shirts. <laughs> but we looked at these callings and the responsibilities that we have in fulfilling these callings in our life. And I wanted to go beyond and look at a couple more today. We're going to look at just a few more of these callings that we have as followers of Jesus that we may not normally think about. The first one I want to talk about is your calling as a community member. You're calling as a community member. We have several responsibilities as community members. One of those, hopefully, 
we just exercised, and that was voting. But not just voting. We don't want to vote for people. We don't want to vote for parties. Our calling is to vote for those, whomever they may be, who will support godly values. Amen. That's who we look to. That's who we vote for. We vote for godly values. One of the other responsibilities that we have that I know a lot of people don't want to do and they try to avoid at all possible, but that's <clears throat> serving on jury duty. Can you imagine anyone better qualified to pass, pardon the expression, judgment on people who are being tried for criminal uh, actions than Christians. Because our desire for justice, just like our Heavenly Father's, should also be tempered with mercy. And so we, can, we should be able to objectively, or as close to objectively as possible, look at the evidence and not be swayed by personal opinion because if we are serving as Christians, if we are serving as those following Jesus, we are going to want justice and mercy. Just like God looks at us and he can, he can give us justice. We deserve justice. But he doesn't always give us justice. He gives us mercy. And because we understand that, we know that justice must, must be served. And as a community member, we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to every other member of our community, to do what we can to keep it safe and protected. We have a calling as a community member. This is one nobody likes, but that's paying our taxes. In Romans, Paul talks about it. He says, pay taxes to who you owe taxes, pay tolls to who you owe tolls, pay respect to those you owe respect to. Don't be cheating on your taxes. Just simply be honest and pay your taxes. It is through those taxes that many of the freedoms that we have in our country today are insured and protected. It's through our taxes that the interstate highways get repaired so that we can travel from here to there and back, wherever there might be. It's through our taxes that our military is paid and keeps us safe, keeps our freedoms protected. And the list goes on and on and on and on. When it comes to taxes, just like everything else, when it as a follower of Jesus, it's not about you. It's about God. If you believe that you have to cheat on your taxes so that you can survive, you're not, you don't have any faith in Jesus. Because he says, I promise, I'll take care of you. I'll provide for your needs. Where we get hung up is we confuse needs and wants. If you can trust Jesus with your eternal, immortal soul, don't you think you can trust him with your cable bill or your phone bill or your tax bill? You ought to be able to. It can simply come down to a matter of faith. Do you have faith in Jesus to keep his promises to provide for? One of the other responsibilities that we have is to support or dissent properly. We've seen a lot of rioting. We've seen a lot of arguing. We've seen a lot of yelling and violence and all of this because people don't feel justice is being handled properly in different areas. And different people in different groups have different ideas of justice. We need to find the godly values and support those. And when people in authority 
are not exercising godly values and godly choices, we need to let them know we don't approve of that. But we need to do it properly. And that's something that's missing quite a bit lately in our country. We can support and we can dissent, but there's a proper way to do it. And damaging people's property, taking people's lives that have not done anything to you and are not actually part of the problem is not the way to do it. You know, I've seen several reports, interviews on TV from these Black Lives Matter protests that have gone on around our country. And many of them have descended into violence and destruction. And I've seen several interviews with <clears throat> business owners who are African American. And they've had their lives, their livelihood, their businesses completely destroyed by these folks that are supposedly saying that black lives matter and we want to support them and we want to help them and yet they're damaging. That's the wrong way to go about it. So our calling as a community member is to support and dissent properly. And one other very important and also not often popular idea is that we need to be praying for our leaders. I do not care if you voted for our president, vice president, congressmen, governors, state senators, whomever. I don't care if you voted for them or not. I don't care if you like them or not. The command in the Bible is pray for them. I made a comment one time on Facebook and I was really surprised. Nobody touched it. So there was a it was some kind of a political post that somebody had made griping about. I don't remember. It's been quite a while. Whomever it was. And I just simply made the statement. You are not. No one should be allowed to complain about our elected leaders until you spent time praying for them. Or, you, or I said something about maybe, I can't remember the exact quote because it's been quite a while. But you're only allowed to complain as much as you have spent time praying for our leaders. And let's face it, if you don't like our leaders, if you don't believe they are putting forth godly values, who needs prayer more than them? Who needs prayer more than them? So we should be lifting them high and champion, championing the idea of praying for our leaders. Because it's only through God that they will change. And it's only through godly prayers that they will see where they're wrong and where they're right. So we need to be praying. As a person living in Salem, we have a vested interest in how this city prospers. And we need to be involved in ways to make it better. We have several responsibilities here. I'm just touching on a few of them. The list goes on much longer than this. Christians, and I kind of hinted at this with jury duty, but Christians should be the most beneficial of citizens to our community. Christians should be the most beneficial to our community. We should be involved in helping the issue of hunger and homelessness. That's why until COVID shut everything down for over six years, we went once a month to Marion Pope Food Share to help out there. We need to be involved in these things. We need to be involved in disaster relief, in volunteering. We need to be involved in recovery and addiction programs, sponsoring them, helping people through them. We need to be involved in supporting our schools because 
you know as well as I do, they need it. Now, it's really hard now. You know, in times past, you could go to one of the schools. We've got two elementary schools. Close enough, you can almost throw a rock and hit them. It was easy. It used to be easy to go in there and say, I want to volunteer to help kids with their reading program. They've had all kinds of names for it over the years. It's not so easy now. But we need to be finding ways to support our schools, to help them. We need to be involved in this. We should have a, an interest in how it prospers. You're calling, not just as a community member, but I want to address for a moment your church community membership, your responsibilities, which is basically serving God, being involved, getting involved in the ministries, making sure you're here when you can. If you're sick, you have to work, different things like that. That's completely understandable. But being here when you can, being involved in as many things as you can, being involved in the ministries, supporting the ministries, giving, giving of your time, giving of your talents and abilities, giving of your treasure, your money, all of these things are necessary. That's part of your responsibilities as a church family member, as a church community member, however you want to refer to it. And lastly today, I want to talk about your calling as a neighbor. Your calling as a neighbor. Now, before you can fulfill your calling as a neighbor, you need to answer a question. You need to answer the same question the expert in the law came and asked Jesus in Luke 10, 29, which is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? As a kid, elementary school age, my best friend's church, he was a pastor's son, and they had a thing for little kids, for younger kids on Sunday night. My home church didn't. So I would go with him, elementary and junior high age. I would go with him on Sunday nights. And his mother, who isn't doing real well right now, but his mother answered that question in a way that I've never forgotten, and it was the best possible answer. And it's a very clear one. Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. He said, who was a neighbor? Well, the one who helped. Her answer to the question, who is my neighbor, was anyone you can help. Your neighbor is anyone you can help. They don't have to live next door to you. They don't even have to live in the same community as you. But if you can help them, be a neighbor. You have a responsibility, a calling from God to help. If you're able to help, help. It's just that simple. You fulfill your calling as a neighbor also by being a witness about Jesus. Telling people about Jesus. About how he died for them. He loves them. They can have their sins forgiven. They can have eternal life in heaven. Just like you can. And just like hopefully you already do. By being a witness... You can be a neighbor. Jesus spells it out very simply in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Being a neighbor, anyone you can help, I promise you, Someone who does not know Jesus as their Savior, they need your help. Because they need to know that Jesus is their Savior. That is the greatest need anyone can have. Now, I will say, and we have our Lord as the example. A 
lot of times before we can meet a spiritual need, we have to meet a physical need. If you look through the scriptures, Jesus never once, except for one time, met a spiritual need before a physical need. And that one time had absolutely nothing to do with the person he was helping. It was to teach a lesson to the Pharisees. It was with the paralytic that was lowered down through the roof. He knew the Pharisees were watching him, trying to figure out what he was doing and what was going on. And so he looks at the paralytic and he meets his spiritual need. He says, your sins are forgiven. They're going, wait a minute, only God can forgive sins. Who is this guy? What is this blasphemy? And so on. And so Jesus looks at him. Again, this is part of teaching the lesson. He says, what's easier for me to do? To stand here and say, your sins are forgiven? Of which there's no physical evidence, nothing you can see. Or for me to say, get up, pick up your bed, and walk out of here. Well, obviously to say, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus says, so just to prove that I am able to forgive sin, because I'm from God. Get up, pick up your bed, and walk on out of here. And he does. As a lesson to those that were watching, he met a spiritual need before the physical need. Every other time throughout the scriptures, Jesus met the physical need first, and then the spiritual need. So if you want to be a witness, and you want to meet a spiritual need in the lives of people around you, you may need to first meet a physical need. But that's part of your calling as a neighbor, to be a witness. These two callings we've talked about today are very general in category because they cover huge areas of your life. They're not quite as specific as a family member. Because your family may be one person, it may be two, three. You may have extended family that leads into the hundreds. But community members, neighbors, those are very general. Your callings come from God. What will you do as a community member and as a neighbor to show you are a follower of Jesus? What are you going to do? How can you impact those around you for Jesus? How can you improve one person's life and eternity this week? So often, one of the prayers that I have is, Lord, help me to positively impact someone's life for eternity today. And then I leave it to God to show me how, where, when, and who. And I always make sure that I ask for God to help me have a positive impact because it's very possible I could have a negative impact on someone's eternity and I never want to do that. So I ask God to help me have a positive impact. What are you going to do this week, this week of Thanksgiving, to have a positive impact on someone's life and eternity? I can't answer that question. But if you'll talk it over with God, He will. And He can answer it. If you do this, you will find out that it's fun it's enjoyable, and it's something you want to do all the time. Serving God, most of the time, is fun. It's enjoyable. It's rewarding. And it's something you want to do over and over and over again. The calling you've received from Jesus comes because you are a follower of Jesus. Callings have responsibilities. So let me just ask you one quick question. Are you living up to your responsibilities? Are you living up to your responsibilities to Jesus in every area of your life or in just some of them? If not, 
If there's some areas of your life you're not living up to your responsibilities, or if there's every area of your life, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix it this week? Don't wait till next week, or next month, or next year. How are you going to fix it this week so that you have fulfilled the calling that you are living a life worthy of the calling that he has given you. I can't answer that question. That's between you and God. I'll be glad to talk with you and see if I can't help point you in the right direction, but that's between you and God. So will you ask him that right now? Let's pray. Father, each and every one of us have responsibilities in our life. We have responsibilities related to the calling, the callings that you have given us to walk worthy of the callings, to live a life worthy of the calling you have given us. Lord, where are we not living worthy? Where are we not living up to our responsibilities? Where are we not fulfilling our calling? And Lord, show us how to fix that. Lord, as we prepare to go today, my prayer is that each and every person will have a positive impact on someone's eternity today, tomorrow, and every day. Lord, make that thought, that desire, burn it into our minds. Make it one of our most important thoughts every day in the morning when we wake up. How can I impact someone positively for eternity today? Help us with that, Father. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen.